Happy holidays. Hope you're having a great weekend. This is Leading Edge. I'm Dan Cummins sitting in for Jerry Anderson. Here's what's coming up. It is winter in Northwest Ohio and Southeast Michigan. Nobody has it worse than people who are homeless living on the streets. We'll hear from two homeless advocates in Lucas County who try and help those without a place to live and a place to eat. Rachel Gagnon and Michael Hart are here. But first, we're about six weeks past the midterm elections. I have one of the freshman legislators who will, who will head to Columbus in January. Please welcome Josh Williams, just elected to the State House in District 41. Josh, thank you, thank so there's some confusion over what number is going to be with all the redistricting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it changed a few times during the campaign, but <laughs> eventually we settled on 41. What made you decide to go into politics? You're a lawyer by trade. Uh, it, it was a long journey. Uh, after, you know, going from being a homeless high school dropout to being disabled and finally digging myself out of that situation and hitting college, when I became an attorney, I just felt like I, I had more to give. I, I had more opportunity to provide change in my community, and politics just was a natural fit. And before that law, uh, what you okay, so you were homeless for a time, yeah. uh, then you had a, an accident at work mm -hmm. when you were a young man, and you were laid up for a long period of time. Yeah. Bring me around to how you got to become a lawyer from that. Uh, so my attorney at the time thought I would be a great workers' comp paralegal. I had become very proficient in that area of law, so I, I, we pushed with the state of Ohio for over a year for me to be able to go to college. Uh, there was a lot of red tape, a lot of hoops that they made us jump through, and eventually I was able to start college at 30. And once I started college, it, it just it was a natural fit. And I just I didn't I didn't initially see myself going to law school, but I had some great supporters and mentors that were pushing me to do things I didn't even think were possible. And uh, eventually, in five years, I got three degrees, including my my juris doctorate. How do you do that that fast? Uh, Laying in Don't tell me nothing else to do. No, laying in bed that, that long, when I finally got the opportunity to show my true potential, I, I took every opportunity. I took max credits. Every summer I was, I was in class with maximum credits. Um, so with proper planning, proper class placement, I was able to do it at an accelerated, accelerated pace. That's remarkable. Now, you, you ran for uh, the State House. You're a Republican, and you know as well as I do, African-American Republicans, let alone Republicans getting elected, is very difficult. Yeah. Uh, how do you get around that? Because I know from talking to Mike Bell, who is so proud of you on election night, he told Appreciate me it. he raved about, about your potential. And also Earl Mack. Republicans, but when they ran for office, mostly independent because you don't want that, that, that R stain on your, on your yeah. you want the I. Well, I, I never hide from a good debate. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a conservative by trade. I was an independent voter my entire history until I declared as a Republican. And I, I'm honored to be the first black Republican in the Ohio House uh, in 50 years uh, on a Republican side. It's been 50 years since we had a black Republican in uh, the Ohio House of Representatives. And, and I'm proud that I'm finally going to be able to be in some of those rooms where decisions are made that can affect people that look like me. I can give a different perspective to our party. Uh, how legislation can change and affect our community. Uh, at the same time, I can promote programs that I think can be effective in helping people dig themselves out of poverty and situations because I've been there. Well, t tell me some of your priorities coming up in the State House. What are you hoping to accomplish? I know you have particular interests. And uh, for let's back up a little bit. Nuts and bolts. January 4th is when you head to Columbus, so you become. January 3rd. January 3rd. January 3rd, we get sworn in. On the 4th, we'll find out what committees we're assigned to. On the 5th is our first day in committee. How'd that process go? Like, they ask you, like, what preferences you have for committees? Yeah, our, our, our speaker-elect, Derek Marin, has sent out requests for where you would like to be placed uh, so he can do his best to place people in the best committees that fit them, uh, their areas of expertise, where they can be an asset um, to the House. And uh, hopefully, I can just be an asset to both the House, the voters, and to my caucus. All right, now, as a lawyer, you have a lot of expertise in that portion of it, and that kind of draws you into certain things of interest mm. uh, as far as being in the State House. Uh, you've talked about uh, reform in the legal system. Yeah. So I'm, I'm very interested in criminal justice reform that, that is reasonable. I'm, I'm an advocate from both sides. I, I advocate for tougher sentencing for violent criminals and the use of firearms in our community. We've seen how firearms are plaguing our community, especially with uh, younger offenders and juveniles. Uh, but at the same time, when people are accused of felonies, we want to create a new system uh, that gives you the right to face your accusers early on before you get the stain of an indictment. So there's some, there was a substantial criminal justice bill that just passed in lame duck session. Uh, but I'll be working with my colleagues to see if we can push it even further. 
All right, what, what can be done to help the city of Toledo situation with guns? Uh, to me, it comes back to the family, uh, parents having accountability, their kids out at two or three o'clock in the morning in the winter, you know, with, with weapons, 14, 15 year old kids with weapons. Yeah, so part of it is, of course, the social issues when it comes to family dynamics. So part of legislation we wanna introduce is a series of pieces of legislation that's guided towards family first, getting back to the idea of a nuclear family, both parents in the household raising a kid. Statistics shows they have a better likelihood of avoiding jail, graduating from high school, becoming productive if they have two parents in the household, uh, but at the same time, we wanna be able to get those offenders off the streets that are really uh, causing havoc in our community. So currently we have a one year and a three year and a five year gun specification that is available to prosecutors. We wanna make a 10 year gun spec. We wanna make a 10 year gun spec where you have a, a felon, a previously convicted felon who should not have a firearm. If they use firearms in violent crimes in the future, it should be a 10 year minimum. One, thing, one more thing I wanna talk to you before I let you go. Uh, parents' rights, that's close to your heart. Um, what can be done at the state level to help protect fathers to see their kids? Well, the first step is to change a statute that makes it where mom is 100% custodial parent of the a minor child at birth if they're unmarried and dad gets 0%. In order for dad to be in the kid's life, if mom doesn't voluntarily let him see the kid, he has to file a lawsuit. It shouldn't be like that. Uh, we both are, are, are making adult decisions that result in a child being born. We both are equally responsible for the child, but at the same time, we both equally have rights to the child. So uh, the idea is to see if we can get more towards 50-50 parenting by statute to an unmarried couple. Um, and then from that point forward, uh, if, they're, if one parent's a better fit than the other, they can file for full, of, uh, full custody. How long will that take to accomplish, you think? That's something that can be easily done if, if there's momentum in the legislature I mean, it all to get makes it sense, done. right? It does, it does. There'll be pushback, um, but there's always gonna be pushback for change. Uh, what we wanna do is we wanna encourage people, one, to get in two-parent relationships, two, to get back into marriages, uh, and, and not just have kids out of wedlock uh, without the idea that the dad's gonna be around. Uh, there's a lot of great fathers in our community. Uh, when I got divorced, unfortunately, uh, a little while ago, I, I got full custody of my son. I continued to raise my kid, um, and, and it was a blessing. It was to stay in my child's life, but I know a lot of horror stories of fathers that went through divorces, and all of a sudden, they weren't in their kids' lives anymore, and uh, we, we should get back to promoting dads being in kids' lives. Josh Williams, thank you so much. This is Josh Williams, a, a Republican uh, state legislator heading to Columbus in January. Josh, thank you so much. Coming up next on Leading Edge, we'll talk about the homeless crisis in Toledo. Be right back. Welcome back to Leading Edge. We've been through a lot the past few years. Pandemic, now crippling inflation, a lot of food insecurity out there. Food banks need to resupply constantly. And the homeless problem, of course, is not going away. I want to welcome Rachel Gagnon from Lucas Metropolitan Housing and Michael Hart from the Lucas County Homelessness Board. How bad is it right now? Uh, the thought was with pandemic uh, that, that pe people's lives are out of control. Mental health is, is worse. Uh, drug abuse, alcohol abuse is worse. But how are things now? It's a great question, and all of those issues contribute to homelessness and can make homelessness last longer. But what we found actually is that the numbers have remained somewhat stagnant, and in fact, across the nation, there is a very slight decrease in homelessness, and that's reflected here in our community as well. Um, what we would believe that while COVID certainly put a lot of individuals um, in that position of potentially experiencing homelessness, and in fact, we saw record numbers of first-time experiences of homelessness, so individuals who have jobs who are working on a regular basis but maybe had a bad, uh, a bad go at things. Um, but what we know, though, on the flip side of that is there have been unprecedented resources. There was a federal eviction moratorium that helped stave off a lot of evictions for many people. There are uh, emergency rental assistance dollars, emergency housing vouchers, and we know that those resources have made all the difference. And if we can get that level of funding on an ongoing basis, we believe we can end homelessness in, in Lucas County. So Rachel, your organization and his, you've worked together in the past, but how do you, you guys work hand? Are you the primary two organizations that work with this? I know there are a lot of others that are involved too. Mm -hmm. uh, Buffalo Soldiers come to mind, but mm -hmm. a lot of organizations help out. Yeah, I think uh, between Michael and I, we could list about 100 partners that we work with on a daily basis. But our two organizations are designed to work together to create a continuum of services. So 
folks who may are maybe at risk of homelessness or experiencing homelessness will typically enter the homelessness board's space uh, and, and work. Um, and what we serve as is kind of a resource at the tail end of their experience as a, an outlet for housing and housing stability and so much more. So really what we do uh, regularly is regular communications, case conferencing, uh, shared resources, search assistance, um, and what it's designed to do is to give a warm handoff from folks experiencing homelessness to uh, inevitably a house or, or uh, an apartment through us. Now it's winter time and you do do a mm -hmm. census to see where the population is and how bad it is to kind of keep tabs on things. Mm -hmm. How does that work? So every year the federal government requires communities to go out into the community um, with volunteers and with partners. Um, and as we said, we have many partners and actually physically seek out those who are experiencing unsheltered homelessness, so are not in one of our emergency shelters and have no place to go, um, and, and really make sure we have a snapshot, a point in time, um, to understand what homelessness looks like. And that's measured against our housing inventory count, which is about how many beds we have in shelters, how many beds we have available in terms of certain types of programming. Um, it it's really helps to give a snapshot. It's not a complete picture. What we know is over 3,000 uh, individuals have come through our system in the past year, and that's 2,300 uh, households. So there is great need. Every uh, experience of homelessness is different. No two situations are the same. So what we know is that many different resources are gonna be part of the solution. And so our job, and sometimes challenging, is to make sure that we're working with all of the systems in the community to better leverage resources and make it easier to navigate that Rachel, talk, system. talk about the, uh, the census itself. How, what's the mechanics of that? Oh, it's, uh, it's an interesting activity, I'll say that. Um, it is on uh, often one of the coldest nights of the year. Um, and we have, uh, and I, I, Michael's leading it this year, so I don't want to speak for you, but uh, we have uh, a team of volunteers that goes out, divides up by zip code typically, and works to uh, engage with anybody that they may encounter. That can be a simple observation. Um, ideally, it's a survey with the individual so we can learn a little bit more about what their background is, what their needs are. To Michael's earlier point, I think any, any statistics or data that we look at is, uh, we need to put a caveat that it is likely an underestimate, uh, a, a lower count than what we really think is happening because folks are maybe doubled up on that night, they may be in their car, we're seeing an increase of, of folks staying in their cars. Um, so the count itself is an uh, imperfect exercise, but it is our best uh, guess on an annual basis. And what do you do with the information? Uh, uh, my impression would be that the, uh, the downtown area, that's the visibility, there's a lot more. And of course, we have a, a, a couple of places they can go to mm -hmm. uh, downtown. But there's also some in East Toledo under the bridge. What are some common areas you find? Yeah, all of that's correct. Downtown is often uh, where some of our longer term uh, homeless individuals um, might be uh, staying. And um, but, but of course, under bridges, there's also a, a different uh, environment on the east side of Toledo. So there, there are geographical lines that separate some parts of our population we serve. And as Rachel mentioned, more and more people have been found in, in parking uh, lots along shopping districts, sleeping in their car. And, and that goes back to that first time homelessness that we're seeing uh, more and, and more. Um, we do have the ability to track where individuals are throughout the year. And, and how we can use this data. First of all, it gets reported and that helps bring in resources for our community. Uh, but also we can use it to, to plan street outreach activities. So if they were unsheltered that night, how do we follow up and make sure it doesn't stay that way? All right, let's take a break right here. When we come back, we'll talk more with these two about the homeless issue in Lucas County. Be right back. Welcome back to Leading Edge. I'm Dan Cummins. Want to welcome again Rachel Gagnon from Lucas Metropolitan Housing and Michael Hart from the Lucas County Homelessness Board. The goal, obviously, is to get people off the streets in housing and not just in, in free housing, but, but support themselves and get their lives back on track. Now, with mental illness, of course, or drug abuse, that's not going to happen. But there's a, a large segment of our uh, population that actually can get their lives back on track. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's you know studies out there that say a good portion of the population are one paycheck away from experiencing yeah. housing instability. So what uh, we focus on at LMH and alongside uh, the Homelessness Board is really creating pathways for self-sufficiency. So when folks enter our space, of course we want to be the safe landing pad, we want to provide the stability for them, but we want to couple that apartment or that home 
with resources that allow the person to really start to build themselves back up, to build the self-sufficiency back up. What that often looks like is workforce development training options, um, child care supports, financial coaching, financial goal setting. Um, so we're really very proud of the fact that, you know, while we are one of the biggest landlords in Toledo and housing is kind of our core uh, our operation, we do so much more to add to that so that we can help folks kind of exit us in a positive way. The, we, do veterans get help too? I know oh, that yeah. the uh, Veterans Services Commission in Lucas County is very proactive mm -hmm. and they have a facility where they try to get, if they hear of a veteran, that they, I mean, there's a lot of help out there for veterans mm -hmm. right now, which is a good thing. But is a high percentage of homelessness are veterans, correct? Um, in our community, uh, I don't know that I call it a high, but 203 individuals presented who were ve also veterans. So you've got a number on Experiencing homelessness this year. Um, we work with a, a number of different partners. Commons at Garden Lake yep. uh, off of Arlington is a great housing provider who serves mm -hmm. veterans. Um, Cherry Street uh, Mission Ministry is a good example where they actually at their facility, and this goes back to that community collaboration, they have a dozen or more mm -hmm. service providers all there so they can coordinate resources and really make sure we, we prevent that as quickly as possible. Um, ultimately, our goal is to ensure that homelessness for anybody, whether it's mental health or substance abuse, uh, is rare, brief, and non-recurring. And we know that while some individuals are going to go through the housing authority, some are going to require and, and, and get to have more intensive supports that, that prove they can be successful in their own housing with a little bit of support as well. So we're, we're excited to continue to enhance those opportunities. So uh, go ahead. Oh, I think it just goes back to Michael's point that it looks different for every person that experiences it. And so part of our charge and our responsibility that we take pretty seriously is creating multiple pathways for folks. So depending on what your needs are, we will meet you where you're at. We'll help make warm handoffs. We'll connect you to the resources. It often starts with a house as the foundation of that or an apartment. And from there, we need to connect you to the other folks in the community. What is the history of homelessness? Has it been around forever around the world? Is this something that is just... Uh, that we're all used to, or is this something that just came along eventually? And is it, I guess another question would be, is it only in America or is it all over the world? Mm -hmm. that, that's a, a good question. Um, homelessness did not exist in our country, uh, or really in the world the way we, we see it today. There's over almost 600,000 individuals in America currently experiencing homelessness over the past year. Um, in the richest country in the world, that's probably unacceptable, I would say. Yeah. And what we know is you, you start to see this happen where communities were, were closer knit, tight knit, but when we started moving west, uh, what, what they used to call hobos would be on the railroad tracks. And it was part of a lifestyle. They were going for work. They were going for opportunity. It was a, it was a choice. And, and of course, when we get to the Great Depression, we see what were called Hoovervilles. And today we call them encampments. But they're tiny little houses and, and makeshift places to, to stay when people were really struggling. And we did a lot better after uh, the Great Depression because we were building public housing in this country at uh, astronomical rates. We stopped doing that right about the time uh, that the Mental Health Act, uh, I think of 1972 passed, which shut down on all the state hospitals for those experiencing mental illness. Uh, the problem was that on the back end, we didn't have adequate resources to support those who needed it most, who no longer were going to be staying in those hospitals. That coincides with a complete reversal and almost a complete stoppage of p building public housing mm -hmm. in this country. We haven't built public housing in America for 40 years or more uh, in, in the traditional sense. And you move into the 1980s, you see a war on drugs that criminalizes people of color. You, you see uh, 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 AIDS epidemic that marginalizes our LGBTQ plus community. And you see these, these parts of our population who already had a tough go at things, already were discriminated against, who were further in the margins. McKinney-Vento was passed in the 1980s, and that's when the federal government finally said, we need to do something about this. But here we are 30 years, 40 years later, and we still have a problem at the end of the day, we have to invest in evidence-based solutions, and we have to recognize that we can do this differently in the greatest country in the world. To answer your second part of your question, this is a uniquely American problem. Is that right? This does not 
exist. Homelessness does not exist because we and other countries, other developed wealthy countries in the world, you have a social safety net that is adequate. Mm -hmm. You have supports. You have health care that's universal. All of these things, when somebody becomes homeless, many systems have failed. Mm -hmm. We have about a minute left, Rachel. Uh, there is a move, sounds like, with the new jail being built, whenever that comes, that there will be a mental health portion there, that they're not just, for people with drug abuse, things like that, instead of just throwing everybody in together, mm -hmm. and that just starts a spiral in the legal system that, that no one's going to win. Yeah, I think we can apply that lesson to just general law enforcement in general, which is, you know, if there is a crisis out and about on the streets, it's not inherently criminal. It could be a mental health crisis, and we need to use different resources depending on what the needs are. That would be the same with the jail. And I would also argue that, you know, for folks who happen to experience homelessness, while sometimes it may be the cause of, of mental health challenges or substance abuse disorders, sometimes those are the effect of homelessness as well. Homelessness in and of itself can be a traumatic experience, and I think we need to look at it in a way that's a little bit more uh, sympathetic and responsive to the actual needs of the people. Rachel, Michael, we this has been a great discussion. Really enjoyed talking to you both, and we'll have to do this again sometime very soon. Nice. We'll be right back to wrap it up. This is Leading Edge on WTOL 11 and Fox 36. Thanks for joining me today for this show. I, I thought it was interesting that uh, learning more about the homeless issue in Toledo area, where will we be in 10 years or 20 years like that? My thanks to Michael and Rachel for coming in. Also to Josh Williams, a freshman legislator heading down to Columbus in January. Have a great weekend, everybody. This is Leading Edge on WTOL and Fox 36.